right, I would like to thank everybody for coming to the Sturgis Public Library today for today's special program about country schools, past and present. Uh, today's programming is brought to you by South Dakota Humanities Council, so if we can just have a round of applause for the Humanities Council. And this, I would like to present Betsy DeLoach. So how many of you went to a country school? Half, at least half. Okay, you will reminisce with my program. And the others will learn something like I did about what is a country school. So if you can't hear me, raise your hand because, um, oh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, oh better. Lots. Okay. Yeah, better. okay, good. Okay, this is my PowerPoint. Country schools past and present. Curiosity started it all. I was asked to enter an art contest by AAUW in 2012, and they gave me four days to provide a, a drawing. And so I chose this photo that I had taken of an old building. That's something I can do in a short amount of time. So I showed the drawing. I didn't do anything with the art contest, but I showed the drawing to a man who said, Oh yeah, I went to a country school and I rode my horse to school. And I thought, I'm sitting here talking to a living person who rode their horse to school. All right, that, that is way beyond any experience I ever had. So then I had a picture framing gallery and one of my customers said, oh yeah, my kids go to a country school. So I thought, this is unbelievable. I never realized that. So I contacted the teacher, and I um, arranged to meet them. And this was the Cheyenne Country School in Hayes. So I uh, went, visited with the kids, took pictures of the children. And in May of that year, they came to Pier, where I lived, and came to my studio, and we did a project with the photograph that I had taken of them. And at the end, they gave me a hug. And I thought that was interesting because I had only met them once before. I wasn't expecting that. They were genuine kids. So then Arliss Griesel and Kay Ainsley and Lucille Emerson contacted me and invited me and I came to Philip spent lunch with them, and they were explaining to me what it means to be a country school teacher. The certifications and all the different elements that go along with that, and they took me to the Magnuson School, which they have restored to a museum. And as I was driving back to Peter, I thought, I took notes, but I have no clue what they were talking about. <laughs> I do now. But that was at the very beginning, and I had no idea. My background is different from that of most people growing up in South Dakota. My relatives came from England. They were clipper ship captains and settled Gloucester, Mass., which if you watch TV, you see the um, tuna fisherman show, Wicked Tuna, and that's where the same location. So this was my hometown in Massachusetts, um, Church on the Green, so on, buildings built in the 1600s. And the Revolutionary Wars, my, our main claim to fame in Lexington. Um, and of course, the Boston Marathon celebrates uh, Patriots Day, which is our big celebration. In Lexington, this was the library the house I grew up in. My elementary school is actually half the size. I couldn't find a picture of it years ago when I went there. So they have doubled the size of it, but it was a fairly big school. And this was my middle school, which is now condominiums. So you can see it wasn't too much like a one-room school. We used to ride our bikes by Louisa May Alcott's house, Henry Thoreau's cabin at Walden Pond. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's house and Ralph Waldo Emerson's home. And we just took it for granted. We didn't think anything of that. 
We uh, went to high school here. And the closest I came to farming was picking blueberries at a dairy farm down the road from us. So I'm hardly a farmer. We rode our bikes to the Conquer Bridge, and on the way back, we would stop at Friendly's and get an ice cream cone for five cents. So when I started asking people or mentioning my drawing, did you go to a country school? All of a sudden, I started hearing stories from everywhere. And that was one thing that intrigued me because there was a passion. When someone talks about their country school experience, they're passionate about it. And I thought, wow, the, you know, having known nothing about it, this was something that made me want to know more. And when I do this talk to people that aren't from South Dakota, I have to explain to them what are the bordering states. We moved out here in 1999 from Virginia, and I didn't really know where South Dakota was. I do now. So what was a one-room country school? Um, logically, you know, it's one room, but there was a lot more to it. It was a school that provided education one through eight, and then K through eight. And the children, uh, came from about a three-mile radius, was where the schools were supposed to be located. And if for some reason the family dynamics changed, they would sometimes move the school. And it might use a stone boat. Well, I'm a sailor, so stones sink. So how could you have a stone boat? Well, I learned, I learned a lot. I learned that a stone boat is like a flatbed and that they could carry these schools with the teams or the tractors and move them. One person told me that there were two families that were disagreeing about where the school should be moved. And the first grader was hiding in a closet because the dads were getting together and he was afraid they were going to fight. And they didn't fight, they just came to a mutual agreement. But he uh, was ready, if they were going to fight, he was hiding from them. So the architectural design was one thing that intrigued me. From log schools to brick, which there are a few in South Dakota, and the middle one is Kappa, that's uh, stucco. Then we also had two rooms. The lower uh, school has two rooms. So Dave Hand from Hawken County was driving me around, showing me where schools had been and we came across this building that had this filigree on the roof. And I thought, okay, can we stop and look and see what this building is? So we looked in the window. There was a blackboard. We knew it had been a school. Anytime you see an abandoned building, if you look in it and see a blackboard, you'll know it's been a school. There was a calendar on the wall dated 1969. So that had to be the last year they used this as a school. I illustrated more schools after that first one, and uh, each school had to have an outdoor flagpole in the state of South Dakota. And then people would describe to me where the different things were around the school. And when I uh, illustrated, I identify what era I'm showing in my drawing because things changed, and someone would come to me and say, oh, well, when I went there, it wasn't like that. And I'd say, well, what time did you go? So that was, and these are some examples of one-room country schools that are still standing. Uh, the top is Palak in Millet County, Comstead in Clay County, and then Doty in Pennington County. I don't know if you're familiar. That is now a community center, and they've added on to it, that's the middle one. And then uh, Mocker in Potter County is a museum, and the Dieter School in Spink County is uh, a museum. So it's nice when they save them and don't let them deteriorate. I did a lot of work in Lincoln County with stories and drawings, and these are some examples of the drawings in Lincoln. Some of these schools are gone now. 
But it wasn't limited to South Dakota. I also illustrated schools in Kansas and Wyoming. It was a random, I didn't really expect to do this project. I never set out to do it. And so it was who I met, who knew somebody, who knew somebody, and that's how I developed it. Um, so I don't have every county and I don't have every school, but everybody that I talked with, I tried to identify uh, their story in the books and also um, draw their school. If I could get a photograph or go to where it is and take pictures. So these are some in Iowa and Minnesota. And I'm, I tell people I'm from Boston. And they say, well, you don't have a Boston accent. And I said, well, I never really did. I've lived in South Dakota for 20 years. They say, oh, yeah, we, we hear that. <laughs> so when I'm talking, I can hear it, too. I don't, when I live in South Carolina, I don't hear myself talking this way as much. Anyway, this is uh, Fall River County. Lithia School has been restored by some of the students that went there. And you can see the large windows in that school because they didn't have electricity. I also uh, went by the Maitland schools right on the highway and uh, in Fall River County. And the teacher taught the kids calligraphy and they made this sign over the doorway. That teacher was Larry Valitz and he's the one that teaches the Native Americans how to tan buffalo hides with the brain tanning. And, um, so those kids were kind of lucky to have a teacher like that, I think. This is the Coffee Flat School at the South Dakota Black Hills, let me think, Black Hills Wild Horse Sanctuary. And this gentleman, Russell Wyatt, sits in the same place he sat when he was a student there. But the school looks different because it was in the Hidalgo movie. And when the movie people came, they changed the school exterior, they, uh, so it doesn't look like it looked when it was used. <coughs> so outside of country school, West River, they had a water pump like this for the cistern. And East River, this was more a typical style of water pump. It has a cable with cups on it that rotate and bring the water up. And I thought that was interesting. West River, East River, there really are two different <laughs> cultures. Yeah. And you can see in their water pump. And then I thought the fences around the schools were to keep the kids in the schoolyard. <laughs> no, they're to keep the cattle out. I learned that. <laughs> see, that's what happens when a city slicker comes in. <laughs> So what was under a schoolhouse? Um, they would have a basement, and the uh, teacher might even live in the basement, but they could use it for inclement weather. They could have recess down there, and some even had a little platform for a stage, and they could do their um, plays down there. And then uh, the top left is in Tuthill, and that one, they had a coal chute to go down into the basement. And how did they enlarge a school? These are, well, they could build onto it, of course, but then they would also sometimes take a school that wasn't being used and add it to one that needed more room and put an entryway between. So the one room country school outhouse. The top ones that are white were built by the WPA in the 30s, and that's a style that you see frequently, but there were lots of other configurations, including one that had a coal bin in between, and even there were some that had more than one um, opening, so then you would have more than, these, this would be a larger one where you would have the boys on one end and the girls on the other end. There was a boys and a girls, and then sometimes there were two-seaters, and then at Maitland, one of the outhouses collapsed, the walls out of it. <coughs> but you can still see the two seats, and one higher and one lower. <laughs> and they had uh, potbelly stoves, 
and kerosene lights. One of the things that I found was they had a fire extinguisher that was a glass globe with a toxic chemical liquid in it. And you could break that and it would snuff out the fire. But it was very dangerous. And so it was a good thing when they adopted these newer, safe ones. Conveniences in a country school, they would have a crock with a spigot. And sometimes they brought the water, the drinking water, with a cream can if there wasn't a cistern at the school. And the parents would take turns bringing that and uh, put it in the crock so they could drink. And they would sometimes all drink out of the same cup or the same ladle, depending. And then they would use that to wash up after recess. There was no indoor plumbing, no electricity no phones. And when I talked to students in elementary school, I described blackboards. They don't know what a blackboard is. They don't, can't imagine that you didn't have a phone in the school. Even this textbook in 1920 shows the students working at the blackboard. So the newer schools have whiteboards, and they still, some of them, have the Abe Lincoln on one side and George Washington on the other side, which was an old way of um, arranging in the old days. So I researched students from the 1920s. Hazel Baumberger lives in Pierce. She's a hundred and something now, and she's in this picture. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and students at school now. I asked them, how did you get to school? So in the 1920s, this person told me her father built a box on a wagon chassis, took a window out of the chicken coop, and they rode to school. So I asked her, how did you not freeze riding to school in a box? And she said they used a horse robe. So I said, what's a horse robe? <laughs> it's the height of their horse died, and they took the height of it flannel backing and use that as a blanket to keep warm. So horses were used frequently. Uh, sometimes they would say that all three kids in the family would ride one horse to school. And usually the one on the back end would have to hang on for dear life because the older siblings in the front might want the horse to run fast. And other pranks like that. <coughs> And then uh, if you couldn't go down the snowy roads to get to school, this dad uh, had the horses tied to a cart and was able to get the kids to school. So this school is in operation now. But in the old days, they would take lunch to school in a lard can or a syrup can or even a more fancy lunchbox, and then later they had these lunchboxes. And they would hang their hats and coats on hooks, and you can see they're doing the same thing nowadays that they did in the old days. Other activities at a one-room school, they might have a play. This is a Halloween play, and the community would come and watch. They also, in World War II, they collected scrap iron at the school. And uh, they might even vote at the school. And then the favorite thing that almost everybody told me they had fond memories of was the Christmas program. And that was where the whole community would come and celebrate. And right after I started showing my drawing and People were telling me it was a country school. They said, oh yeah, we used to play where we pour water down a hole, the gopher would run out the other hole, and we'd hit it with a bat. And I thought they were kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> but then I have this documentation that shows it. In 1935, the uh, person showed that her dad was in that group of kids. and. Um, I've heard that story enough times, I know it is real. But if we had done that at my school, 
we would have been expelled. <laughs> and uh, but we didn't have grass. We had paved, paved too much pavement and no gophers. But they were saying that if they killed the gopher, they could take the tail to the courthouse and get a nickel. So it was a thing to do. Then there were merry-go-rounds on the playgrounds of all shapes and sizes. And they would play ball. Ball was a common thing. Almost everybody told me they had any eye over and softball, baseball, um, other games, and tug of war. And what was interesting to me Meeting the kids in the schools that are operating now, they play the same games their grandparents played. They've passed them down, and they still continue to play those same games. The schools all had swing sets, or swings, of different configurations. And uh, this one is Deep Creek in Hawkin County. And what impressed me, too, was the remoteness you can see there's nothing behind this until you go over the hill. You would, there's nothing. And at one time, I did a talk in Spearfish when I was still learning about this. And I said it was in the middle of nowhere. And after the man came up and said to me, it wasn't the middle of nowhere, it was somewhere. We lived there. <laughs> so I felt bad that I had called it nowhere. So the giant stride was a favorite thing. Does anybody remember what a giant stride is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. I did a drawing, and there was a pole, and I didn't include the pole in the drawing. And the man asked me, where's the giant stride? So I said, what is a giant stride? Well, it's a pole with chains hanging down, and the kids would grab the chain and run around and swing out. And then a bar on them. Yeah, right. That's right. And um, nowadays, they wouldn't allow that so, on playgrounds, I'm sure. So the school teacher, we were talking about that earlier. In this schoolhouse, she turned the piano at an angle in the corner and had a cot behind it. And she would live there during the week and go home on weekends. And this is an actual one room school. Um, and then there was a teacherage. And sometimes there was a lean-to against the school that uh, the teacher lived in so she could walk from the classroom into the, her apartment. In Hayes, on Highway 34, if you go toward Pier from here, you would pass this teacherage. But it's now been demolished. And I heard a lot of stories of kids and teachers who were there and had a lot of fun events in this teacherage. It was really an important room, and I'm so sorry they decided to tear it down, but it was falling apart. So uh, the teachers in Stanley County, in Hawkin County, these are 1920s, and the way they got to school. Now, Betsy Pollock lives in Pierre. I met her, and she came from Connecticut to teach at the country school in Stanley County. And she said when they had a cattle drive go by, she and her daughter looked out and they were fascinated. And so was I when I saw this one, the Kamek Ranch in uh, Mead County. And she said no one else in the school were looking out the windows at this. They had seen it before. <laughs> And the teacher at Stoneville would live in a house trailer. And then Deep Creek, the um, only time the teacher had to stay there, she lived close enough to commute. But during an emergency or a blizzard, she had a cot to stay in at the school. So there was a flood in 1938 in Lando County, uh, Lando. And Tilly Van Orman was the teacher there and kept all the kids in the school, and the water came right up to the bottom of the window sills. And after the storm had subsided, they looked out and there was total devastation outside, and people actually were killed in the flood. But all the children were saved. And I heard this from her nephew, Quentin Van Orman, who had been, is a retired highway patrol. 
And in the 40s, they decided to have this story and her, a picture of her on the heroic comics because she was a hero keeping the kids in the school instead of trying to get home or go out where they would have been swept away. So the way teachers got to school was different depending on the year. And uh, there's some examples. Another teacher that you might have heard of is Alice Kundert. She was Secretary of State here and um, involved in politics for many years, a role model for women in politics. And she went to country school and taught in several country schools in Campbell County and Walworth County. So the floods in 1952 in Fort Pier wiped out the classroom that they were using. And then along the Missouri River, of course, you know, goes right by. And this is the Rousseau School and the Wagner School. And the teacher, Fern Berry, is standing there waiting to be rescued. In 2009, the Orton School closed in Stanley County, and all of the teachers that were still living had a reunion there. So these were women who were teachers at that country school. So the student and teacher desks, uh, there was a re recitation desk up near the teacher's desk, and that way they could have their grade level classes with the teacher. And then these, in this picture at the top, show double desks where there were two students side by side, which I think would have been quite a challenge. If you had somebody beside you, how could you not play with them, you know, do your work? And then later they had this other style of desk, and sometimes the teacher had a tabletop desk, and other times she would have a desk that had deep drawers, so there was no real, it just depended on area that they were in. I got to know Governor Walter Dale Miller. He went to school in Meade County in 1930s. This is his report card from third grade. And it was interesting to me because on the front of the report card, it says, to the pupil. You can probably read it then. And it says, be clean in person, dress, habits, thought, and speech. Be dutiful, polite, and respectful to parents, teachers, and all whom you may meet, and continues giving direction to the pupils. And then on the back, it gave instructions to the parents to pay attention to this, and if your child is not doing well in school, get in touch with the teacher and come visit the school anytime we welcome you to come visit the school. So I thought that was interesting that though that information is right on the report card. And then they judged or graded them on habits and attitudes. So he apparently was a pretty good student. Then in Iowa in the 30s, they had a quote from Emerson on their report card saying, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. And then to the parents, in this other report card, it says, Blessed is that boy or girl who has behind him the urge of an appreciative and understanding parent. I don't think the report cards are like that anymore. This one was um, Jean Peters was the teacher, and the student was Joyce, her youngest sister. So in Lyman County, in the 60s, they had Mount Rushmore on their report card. Does that look familiar to you? From oh, yeah, it's Louis Lightman. Like. No, he's from my hometown. See? <laughs> South Dakota is a small town in some ways. He was much older than me, but. Oh. <laughs> well, actually, the student is Teresa. Teresa oh, Teresa. Oh, seven, yeah. Like, seven. I gave her a piano lesson. Okay, <laughs> and she went to the Comp School, which yes. is I illustrate, which is abandoned and you know whatever. So the materials, handwriting, they learned how to do cursive. Nowadays they don't teach cursive. 
And that's a story too. That um, and they could win a, a certificate if they had good penmanship. One person told me that she wrote a letter to her grandson to open when she passed away. And when she passed away, he opened the letter and he couldn't read it because it was in cursive. They had awards and for attendance. And what intrigued me about that was that they had classic art on these awards with a description of the art inside. So they were getting art history as well as an award for attendance. Those are book reports, I think. That one with the art. I have one of mine that has a picture of Blue Boy. And it, you had to list the books that you read. Okay. And then these are some examples of diplomas. And they had globes that were suspended that they could raise and lower, which are out of date now, of course. So Young Citizens League, that was unique to South Dakota. Um, the Yeah, YCL. And it was initiated, created by a teacher in Minnesota. In 1910, M.M. Gwynn, who was the superintendent in Brown County, adopted it, and then it became um, adopted by the whole state in the 20s. And this is where they taught parliament procedure, and the children together elected officers and assigned tasks, and it taught responsibility, and uh, at the end of the year, they would have a project that they displayed uh, that had been done through the YCL. And what in, was funny, one audience I had, I asked them if they knew the YCL song, and they all sang it. <laughs> so that, that was pretty good. I can't sing it, so I won't. But um, the illustrations in some of the textbooks, these are in the 20s, kind of interesting. 30s and the 40s. And they show girls playing softball in skirts. At the end of the year, in early 1900s, the teacher would give the kids a souvenir. They don't do that now, as far as I know. And they would have a list of students and a poem and some, whatever else the teacher came up with, her photograph. And what I thought was good is that the students kept these. These are things that people had kept from years ago. They were important. So the blizzard stories, of course, living in South Dakota, and the spreading bird in Millet County. There were four students and a teacher who were trapped in the school during a blizzard. And they were sleeping in a room that had a space kerosene heater and the kids realized at some point in time that the teacher had lost consciousness, that she had been overwhelmed by the fumes from this. So the kids, for two days, took care of the teacher and themselves and saved her life until somebody could come and rescue them. And she went straight to the hospital and survived. And it just shows you the life skills that the kids had growing up on a ranch or farm, as well as being in a country school. Also, in North Dakota, um, during a blizzard, they were trapped at the school, and the dad and neighbor came with a wagon like this, full of hay, and got the children in it, and then they couldn't see how to go. So they let the horses go, and the horses went right to the barn. And after they got there, they um, put the horses up, and then they held hands in a chain and walked to the farmhouse and survived that one. And then in Stanley County, in FIBA, in the 1950s, it was a blizzard, and there were eight children, and the father and one neighbor brought a long rope, and they all held on to the rope, and marched to the closest house, which was several yards from the school, but they needed the rope to keep them from getting lost. And that school's gone now, too. So, Deep Creek in Hawkin County, 
I visited them in 2013, and then in 2014, they invited me to their Valentine party. So, I thought I would be the only one, besides the student and the teacher, at this party. And it turned out that the whole community was there. There were 25 or 30 people. And it taught me then how important the country school would be in a remote rural community where nothing, I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere, and how any events like this were supported by the community. Also, you can see I gave the kids a flag that's been flown over the Capitol. It has a certificate identifying that as a thank you for letting me come visit them. So what happens when a one-room or country school is abandoned? The top left one, before I had seen a picture of it, they told me they turned it into a cake house. And I thought, why would you have a bakery way out here? <laughs> and then I learned that cake is what you feed, feed cattle, so now I get it. The other one is a granary, it used to be a school. And the bottom picture, is one near Bear Butte, where the horses are going into the school and using it as their shelter. Which reminds me that in 2014, there was Atlas Storm in October here. And a lot of livestock were lost. So one of the ranchers was surveying his ranch and came across this little building and looked in, and his herd was in it. They had gone in the building and couldn't get back out. And so during the blizzard, they were protected by this, what turned out to be a little schoolhouse. So the modern schools, Milesville in 2014, some of these kids have probably already graduated by now. Elm Springs in Meade County, 2015. Then Atoll, I visited them in 2015, and then I went back and visited them in 2017. And the teacher had a bell that had been given his aunt, who had retired after many years as a teacher. And so he's following in her footsteps. Big White in Pennington County, I just found out yesterday closed last year, but when I visited them in 2017, this was the school and the kids, and these kids were third generation at the same school. So now they're actually being homeschooled because they can't get travel to the closest school since this one has been closed. Meade County has Opal, I went there, and this shows you how the children learned how to play a game all ages. And that's a life skill, that where the ki older kids are teaching the younger kids, and that all this group of children are playing a game on the playground. To me, that's a very significant. And then Union Center, in 2017, was still a school. It's been closed now. And any who is now consolidated, or that school and Union Center have been consolidated into a brand new school. I don't know the name of the new school. Central Meade County. Central Meade County, okay. And um, it, it's unfortunate, unfortunate to me, in a way. I understand the economics and everything, but when I was at this school, one of the kids explained to me that he could walk to school. And now at the new school, it's too far and he can't walk to school. And I thought, you know, that's one of the nice things about having a rural school, is that the kids were in their neighborhood and they knew the others in their group. So this is, the picture shows the close-up of the kids are the lower grades and they're the ones I talked with and gave a flag to. And then I took a picture of all of the students that were upper and lower grades. Hereford, I 
I went there in 2015. I actually found my way all the way there. And they have teeter totters with saddles on the end. That's <laughs> I know. And then uh, Shalane Graham saw my book and uh, called me and said, is there any way you can come out for our first day of school? We have a tradition of riding horses to school on the first day. They've done this for 40 years. And I said, well, I live in fear, so I don't know how I can get out there the first day of school. So I stayed at her ranch, which to me was a treat. And they started at the break of dawn and went a total of six miles collecting people all the way along who were friends, family, students and teachers, all the way until they got to the school. And this is Shalane and her daughter, and they both had been or were students at Hereford, and they ring the bell, and this is the students on their horses. And this is another example of how remote this is, how there's nothing behind them, as far as you can see. And if you turn around, there's nothing on the other side either. It's like, they, they really, they live 60 miles from anything, much, and uh, they even commute 20 miles in some of these schools to get to school every day. You showed a picture of earlier of a young man on a horse by the Hereford School. Yes. On the first day of school. And one year, one adventuresome young man, um, that building that showed, there were two buildings there. One had two doors into the school. Oh, man. And um, he kind of took a dare from a friend and yeah, the building on the left has two entrances. Uh, someone just happened to open both doors and he rode his horse right through the middle of the school and out the other door. Okay. <laughs> well, that's memorable. Yeah. 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 That's a good story. Yes, and um, when I can add this too, the um, after they all rode their horses, and I don't ride, so I was on the ATV going along with them, and then they had the trailers at the school, so they put the horses in the trailers and took them back home, and I had to wait for my ride. So uh, the teacher said, to this little second grader. I sat on this little table with this little second grader, and um, the teacher said, would you like to read Mrs. Deloach a book, a story? And he said, yes. So she said, why don't you go pick out a book? So he did, and he sat down beside me, and he started reading to me. And he was continuing until finally he took a break, and I said to him, you are a good reader. And he looked right at me and said, thank you. And I thought I was going to fall off my chair. <laughs> because this little kid I had never met before, young, and had the confidence and the ability to just be completely at ease, comfortable with me, a stranger, and read. And I just thought, OK. I kept getting more and more um, willing to accept that country school is really a very wonderful thing. And when I first started this, I thought, oh, that would be mediocre. I mean, I had an elite education near Boston where the parents in our school were professors at Harvard and MIT. I mean, we had everything. We never learned life skills. We never learned how to go on a playground and play with a group of kids of all ages and how to make that work. So anyway. So one person was telling me that they had to go to the Christmas program with a horse and sleigh, and that the kerosene lights were shining out on the snow. And as she described this to me, I had a picture in my mind. So I drew a, the picture of what she was telling me. 
And that's in my first book um, as the Christmas design. And then for the second book, there's the Bronson School in Tripp County that's been abandoned, but it was a different style of school, so I used that for my second book. And then the third and last book, I did this one based on a photograph in 1902. And this school is no longer standing, but some of them, they even had the flagpole up on the top of the bell tower, and uh, would have to, but this is East River, so you didn't necessarily see this kind West River. So, I ended up, without planning it in advance, I ended up doing this book. In 2015, I published it, and I have 51 counties, 10 states, 600 pages. And I had really been waiting for the stories to dwindle down and then do the book. Well, they never dwindled down. So I finally just did the book and had leftover stories. So I did the second book and added more by, you know, collecting more stories. And then people said, well, you will do another book, won't you? And so, so I did a third book. And I actually published this after I moved in 2018. I moved to South Carolina. And in 2020, I published this book. And this is the final book. I'm interested in hearing stories, but I'm not going to publish them in another book. <laughs> and I also will do drawings. Um, I recently was contacted by Julie Dahl, and she was a teacher at Alkali School. And I had never heard any stories from Alkali, so I'd never done any uh, drawing of it. And so she went out and took pictures, and I have now done a drawing of it. And I meant to bring that with me, but I forgot. Oh no, there it is. See? <laughs> okay, so she taught in, um, let me go back. She taught in 1996 to 98 at this Cheyenne School in Hawkins County, right on Highway 34. And then from 98 to 2000, she taught at the Alkali School. And that's the drawing. And she lived in a house trailer beside the Alkali School, but when she was at the Cheyenne School, she lived in the basement and actually was trapped in there during a blizzard, had to live with her dog. And she had a dog with her, so I added him to the, or her, her name was Britta, and I added her to the picture. So, so um, in South Dakota, some of the comments that I consistently heard were that the kids in the country school felt looked down on by the town kids. And sometimes when they went to high school and had to go to town, they were actually academically advanced to the kids in the town school. Not always, but sometimes. And I noticed that a lot of the valedictorians and salutatorians actually came from a country school. So I thought that was intriguing. And this person said that nowadays people who are farmers are quite respected, even though at the time when they were in school, they didn't feel that way. Now that I live in South Carolina, I've tried to encourage them to listen to these stories, and they don't want to hear about South Dakota. So I've tried to talk to some more people about their country school experience in South Carolina. And it was a consistent thing to what I've been hearing here, that we country children did not know we were poor by the world standards. We all had outhouses and got water from a well or spring. One family had their well on the porch, which was really nice because you didn't have to go far to get water. And we lived on dirt roads, which here you call them gravel roads, which made it necessary to have a country school not far from our home. And this person actually went to school in the Blue Ridge Mountains of South Carolina. So that was um, very important because there, it's like Deadwood, where the windy roads and, you know, comparable to that. And then uh, one of the sisters in Aberdeen, I interviewed quite a few of them, and she said, our school was our family. 
They were and are, somehow, community bonds that seem unique to rural school. And a lot of people, and I heard it again today, said that this was the best days of their life when they spent their time in country school. So thank you for having me come and considering my story and listening to this. And these are some examples. Uh, Riverside was in Meade County. I don't know if it's still standing. New Ridge is out at White Owl. It was a community center. I don't know what they're doing out there now. Um, it looked different when I drove by. And then this is how Hartford looked before there were two school buildings in the 1960s. One of the teachers that had been there um, showed, explained to me how it looked there. So I really appreciate the Northern Plains and the life out here. If you didn't have winter, I would still live here. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody have a comment or question? Yes. You didn't ask if anybody here had taught country school. OK. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and we have a principal. A principal, yeah. Hey. That's why you look familiar. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, so. I've got, a, <clears throat> I've got a story you probably didn't hear from some of your kids. When I was in country school, it was in southwestern Minnesota, and there were just seven kids before it closed. But somebody found a dead bird, so it was decided we had to have a funeral. <laughs> so we dug a hole, put the bird in the hole, and we all stood around and somebody said, well, we have to sing something or say something. So somebody came up and said, well, let's sing a song. <laughs> so what they came up with was, put another nickel in in the Nickelodeon. <laughs> <laughs> and then we all went our own way. So. <laughs> That's good. Yes. I went to country school my first eight years of school and never had a person in my grade. Awesome. I, I was alone in my class every year mm -hmm. uh, until I went to high school. That was the first time I ever had anybody in the same grade. Also, I want to make a comment on YCL. We had county conventions, and, and then there would be county officers, and then there would be an election, and they would select delegates to go to the state convention in Pier. And I got to go one year when I was seventh or eighth grade, eighth grade, I believe, as a delegate to the state YCL convention. And that was a year that Butte County was picked to escort Governor Ralph Herseth, how old I am, um, <laughs> it, to the podium when he spoke to the convention. And I got to go to his office and meet his staff and meet him. And for a little kid from a country school, that was really impressive. Um, yeah. And thanks to YCL. Right. Yes. I remember having hot lunch <clears throat> because we used to take our soup in a peanut butter jar and loosen the lid and put it in a pan of water on top of the cold stove in the morning, and by noon it was hot. And I also remember when the, the county superintendent came, and it was always a surprise. We never knew when she was coming. But she would visit all of the country schools each year, maybe a couple <clears throat> times. And she came out of Kennebec, which was the county seat, and she would visit all those schools, and we were always so thrilled because, or I was, because I got to read to her. All right, see? Yeah, good. See, I love these stories. It's, um, well, I know, too, they put potatoes in the bottom of the pot belly stove where the ashes were, and they heated them up during the school day for lunch. And then, um, some of the schools had a grate on the floor because they had a furnace or stove or some heat source underneath and they could heat their lunches up that way too. We just yeah. had a coal, coal stove. But, yeah. And then eventually they had oil heaters in some of these schools because if it's an abandoned school and you go in, it has the oil heater still sitting there. I don't know, they just left it, everything. Right? Yes. You talk about the, the advancement. In, in those country schools, I think if you had any curiosity at all, you couldn't help but hear what was going on in the older grades. And I had a, a friend who went from
from second grade, and then they moved into town because the dad had died. They went into town as a third grader, and they're like, why are you here? So they bumped into fourth grade instantly. Now, as an aside to that, he, he was uh, <laughs> Mayaw's, Mayaw County Public Defender's Office. <laughs> Where do you learn cursive writing? Third grade. So his signature all the way through <laughs> his legal documents are printed because he never learned cursive writing very well. <laughs> kind of this hodgepodge thing that kind of put together on his own because he never did have cursive writing. He never did have third grade. Yeah. See, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, and they aren't teaching much in history anymore, is what I've been told. Which well, I think is. Well, you pick awesome. a scab there. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. And I just don't understand it, but I'm not a teacher. I, I've never been in education or anything, so this is all new to me. Did you have a comment? Well, yeah, I was thinking that Mrs. Flaggy's story gave a whole new meaning to I rode my horse to school, the one that rode his horse <laughs> clearly through the school. But I also went eight grades, all as a single person in my grade. I've never met anybody else like that. I'm really glad there was another one. <laughs> and you pointed out some of the very positive things about going to a country school. And I think another one, he started to touch on it. You were introduced to these things, you know, that the big kids, the big kids were doing and you could hardly wait to get there and do it. And then if you didn't quite master it, then you could review as the you became one of the big kids, you know, and they were still teaching the same things. But right. there were some really good things about country school. Oh, yes. We learned to fold the flag, which these kids no yes. longer do. No. And when I was on a trip down in your area with my daughter last summer, I got to help fold the flag at one of those old forts down there when they took it down. Yes, and when I give them the state flag, and they hold it up because we want to take a picture. And the next thing I know, they're folding it and putting it where it belongs. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have nothing. I know there weren't perfect. And I know there were issues, different things. But I don't know if you're familiar with the DKG. The Delta Kappa Gamma is like an elite teacher sorority. In South Carolina, they invited me to come and talk about this. So I did, and afterwards uh, I had mentioned something, and they said, what about discipline? I said, there was no need for discipline. That's 99% of the answers. I had a questionnaire that I would send to people to re send me their story, and that way I would have their contact information and the dates and everything, and they could answer questions or tell me anything else they wanted to tell me. But Sometimes when I met someone, they'd say, oh, well, I really don't remember. So I designed it to prompt them to think of things. And one question was, how uh, were students disciplined in your school? And the, almost 100% said, there was no need for discipline. So when I tell the people in South Carolina there was no need for discipline, they can't believe it. And That's I, because you we're told before school started that um, if you got into trouble at school, it would be nothing compared to the trouble you were in when you got home. So right. The only trouble I ever had with any kid was my own, and I hauled him outside the door, tapped him on the bottom, and said, we don't do that here, because he had been to town school before. So I didn't have any discipline problems there. Right. Well, and someone said they were, um, all the other kids were either neighbors or siblings, and they didn't want to embarrass themselves in front of these people. We did have a disturbance in our school, though. A kid from Queens, New York. <laughs> His aunt and uncle lived a quarter of a mile from the school, and he got kicked out of Queens and came to live with his aunt and uncle, so he came to our school. That didn't fit in very well, although we became friends, but right. he had some very different habits that required some controls. Right. But that's the only one I remember. Right. Well, and the kids had a purpose. They had chores before, and then at school there were tasks the kids did, yeah. and then chores after school. And if you didn't have that much 
responsibility, you would have more time to figure out ways to get in trouble. I think. Those were, we had YCL duties, and the one I hated was cleaning the erasers and all that chalk flying all over. But we, we somebody did the flag, pushed the flag up, somebody took it down, somebody did the uh, blackboard, somebody did the eraser, somebody cleaned the cloakroom. We had those duties. Um, I don't know if it was every day now or once a week. I don't remember that, but I remember I did not like cleaning the erasers from the back. There were a couple of ways that were disciplined, and they were mentioned here, but also uh, you show the report card of Walter Dale Miller, that's, that's the way we get uh, shown if we were, uh, parents would be shown whether we were uh, polite in class or whatever. And the second one was we had a, um, uh, I'll call it a tag board because it, I don't know what it was called then, but the, the teacher had different colors silver, gold, blue, and red, and black stars. Mm -hmm. And every day you were, you got a, a mark. If your hair was combed, you got a you know, gold flag. If you didn't brush your teeth, you got a black flag. And so if you, all the students would see that student had a black flag because he or she, me, uh, didn't do one of the, the things. And so there were ways that the teacher disciplined without really discipline. Yeah, right. And well, and it seemed to, and I talked to a friend of mine, um, the parents were involved. And even when I was at uh, Deep Creek that day when they had the Valentine party, at the end of the party was the end of the day. And so I went out on the playground, the camp, uh, campground, the school ground, and um, the teachers teacher was talking to the parents, the kids were playing, and the parents were talking to each other, and there was a lot of communication going on. And I noticed the other time I had been there, there was a pickup truck parked, and then another truck came, and they parked next to it, and the two parents came out and were talking while they were waiting for the end of the day. And I thought, see, there's a lot of communication going on here which is really great. I, I do want to uh, make one other comment that I've written several books, and so I compliment you, first of all, for uh, taking a topic like this and putting it into massive volumes. That's a tremendous amount of work, and so I compliment you on that. But you did a tremendous service uh, by, by putting these stories together and by sharing your stories with us and others. I really think that's fantastic. Thank you, I appreciate that. And that was one thing that kept me going with this project. Um, and I can share with you, which I wasn't going to, but I will, that I'm a cancer survivor. I've had colon cancer since 2008, and five recurrences during that time. And every time I got back where I could do things, then I was back on the project, back on the project. And so I really, think that that was one of the reasons why I managed to survive, other than the doctors and nurses and surgeries and everything else, that it, I had a purpose too. And the fact that people will say to the drawing, oh, it looks like it looked when I went there. And I thought, great. Especially if it's disappeared now and no longer around. And then uh, just preserving the history is, you know, and I've become a very serious in that wanting to, uh, don't just tear it down, reflect back on what happened before and learn from it, yeah, so thank you. Hey there. Hi, how are you? It's good, good to see you again. Yes. Um, a couple of things too that um, I wanted to share is we had a couple of, um, uh, our Meade County Schools have been refurbished you know, some to their original, they left the one that's out, um, except 57, I think is what it is. Do you know where I'm talking? No. I think it's out on except 57. Um, Carrie and Daryl, Darren Odell own it. And they um, just put like new siding on everything and they tried to keep as much of the original, the original stuff inside um, they're putting um, 
uh, there was a couple spots on the floor that they had to remove. They just replaced where it was and then tried to get original, you know, original flooring back in there. And it looks really, you know, the chalkboard they left, they just, it's amazing that they, um, they said they kept driving by it and they didn't want to see it go to waste. And so, yeah. I think that's what we found out was the Pleasant Valley School. Pleasant yeah. Valley, yeah. Yeah, yeah because Pleasant Valley. Yeah. Joe took yep. me there. Yeah. And the swing was still there. They tried to keep it, but it was like really amazing. It's on Cardinal Road. And so before we knew what it was named, I called it the Cardinal School. Yeah. But then the archives, I got to know all the people in the Cultural Heritage Center. And before, now they've all changed, and now they've closed it because they couldn't remodel it. But um, they figured out by their aerial surveys and stuff that it was the Pleasant Valley School. Yep. So yep. see, I know, why not repurpose? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some that have been made into residences and mm -hmm. community centers, but the majority are left to fall apart. Mm -hmm. so. so. I know the other one is up there on um, Bear Butte, yeah. Bear Butte. You had the, I think you had a picture of the one with the horses in it. Yes, the horses. Yes. Oh, and that, it just that, happened to be going in and out when I was right there. Uh -huh. So I thought, yeah. Uh -huh. And that one's redone too, and the, the whole inside outside as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I got, it, it's too bad. I worked for the state for many years, and um, I was the, uh, Final records registrar for the state, and I had to go to each courthouse every, in every county and teach the register of deeds how to il uh, issue a electronic birth record or whatever. And I invited them to Peter to the uh, computer center and to teach them. And then I realized then that they had never used a mouse, had never used a computer. So I couldn't very well teach them that way. So I went out to each courthouse and taught them in their own environment how to use a computer and how to issue the records in their office. And that gave me an opportunity to travel all over the state and see tiny towns that I never realized there were such small towns. <laughs> Is that bison? I mean, really, mm -hmm. that's a tiny. And, um, but anyway, and so, um, oh, I don't know where I was going with that, but um, there were, oh, I wished at the time I hadn't even heard of a country school. I wished I had because I probably would have seen a lot more of them out in the fields. And, uh, but, and unfortunately, a lot of people, and it's economic, I know, can't restore them or maintain them on their property or wherever they are. Turn them into a cake house. <laughs> Not a bakery, cake house. Well, yes. There's, okay, go ahead. There's one, there's a schoolhouse in, in um, Buffalo in the northwest corner. Um, it's with the painter school. It was way out in the corner of um, a corner of um, South Dakota. And it was moved into town. It's a museum now. Oh, great. That was my first tour. Oh, how neat. Yeah. Well, I'm glad they repurposed it. That's good. I know. So, did they move it with a team or like tractors? I don't know how they got it. Probably not flatbed. Yeah. So, yes. You mentioned tiny towns. I lived right, uh, was raised right in between Bison and Buffalo which are both quite small towns, but then you didn't mention Struel and Prairie City and Riva and yeah. all of those that have, like yeah. Sorum has three buildings, you know, a church, uh, which had at one time been the high school where my dad went to school, and a store and one house. And, uh, and then you mentioned preserving history and the penmanship. I have one of those clear plastic guides with the alphabet on it, and you had to practice your alphabet, and then you laid that over the top to see if your penmanship matched exactly like. And so 
I also had the same teacher for the first six years, and then when she went to town with her children to go put them in high school, one of her former students had graduated already and finished up the next two years. So wow. my, my education was probably all the same. Right. Same guidelines. Well, I drove from Britain to Bison. And when I went through Lemon, or somewhere in between there, there was a sign saying Faith. And I was going to go there the next day. So I thought, well, I don't want to go down that road because that's where I'm going the next day. So I kept on going and going, and I saw North Dakota. <laughs> this can't be right. So, so I had an atlas that showed the map, and I saw that I should have taken the turn to faith. But there was a county road paralleling it, and I wouldn't have had to go back all those miles, and it was starting to get dark. And I'm in a state vehicle, and my husband was the director of the fleet for the state. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna take this county road because it goes the same way. And all the roads are square, you know. So I went on that road and it got dark, and there were no fences, no power poles, no buildings, no cattle, nothing. <laughs> I thought, you know what? I'm afraid. I, and then I thought, well, I am a sailor, and I've been on the ocean in a boat at night. And it's the same feeling where the ocean's out there and it's moving around, but you can't see it. And these, whatever was beside this road, were little hills, I think, it seemed like. And they were kind of that way. And I thought, okay, I've lived through this before, I can do this. But uh, finally, in the distance, there was that tiny light. Way, way, and I drove into Bison, and I saw the place I was supposed to spend the night, a little hotel or B and B or some some building. So I went straight there, and the man didn't even look up from the counter. He just handed me a key. I thought, how does he know who I am? <laughs> so I went and spent the night, and the room was decorated with the green ivy. That, I don't know what year that was popular. <laughs> green ivy, everything green ivy. And so the next morning, I wake up and I look out, and there's the courthouse across the street. Oh. And there were like two or three other buildings in the town. And that's it. And I thought, gee whiz, this is a small town. <laughs> so yeah, I had a lot of adventures living here, but. It was all great. The one thing, though, the first year, and we, you can stop me any time, but the first year I was here, we had a round thermometer on the back deck, and it registered 22 below zero. I thought, that's not the wind chill, that's the temperature. I thought, well, oh, they'll call off work. <laughs> no. <laughs> we lived east of here on 34, about four or five miles or six miles out. And uh, I learned how to have all the things in my vehicle that I would need if I went off the road or got, there were a few times you couldn't even see that short distance. And, cause I worked in pier. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> all I have to do is watch out for hurricanes. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had a few, but nothing. We're two miles from the ocean, so anything that erodes the beaches and stuff like that isn't affecting us directly. Uh, but what they do is they go out to sea and dig up the sand that's been washed out and pump it back onto the beach, called renourishment. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how long they're going to do that because Mother Nature is deciding that. We don't need as much beach. <laughs> so, but anyway, well, I think this is the end. Well, thank you very much for coming, and, and uh, yeah, super proud of you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, and if you have.
have questions, if you want to look at our stuff, it's up here. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. Are your books for sale? Yes, they are.